Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody. How you doing? I hope you're happy, healthy, doing the things that you love with the people that you love doing them with. Guys, this is episode 127 of Tottenham Walks with me, Sean Butler, and the little one, Bugsy Malone. Can you see her? I think you can. She's just had an argument with some swans or some geese. I don't know the difference. Do you? Guys, let me start the show by asking for my usual favours, if you don't mind. And only if you don't mind. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. And if you haven't, then welcome to the team. And if you have, then welcome back, guys. Welcome back. Uh, hit the notification bell if you'd like to stay on top of when we drop the content so that you can drop a comment. Be first to contribute to the conversation. And I love the conversation. It's usually nine times out of ten. It's always incredibly respectful. Incredibly contributing to the conversation, development of arguments, and uh, always said in, in good faith. That's what I love about you guys. I adore you for it. So thank you, keep them coming. Guys, let's get on with the show, shall we? Let's talk some transfer news updates and the like today. First out of the block, let's talk a little bit about Marcus Edwards and Pedro Porro. Nothing really has changed. Tottenham are still trying to figure out, you know, how they, I guess, can get away without paying what uh, what uh, Sporting want for him. And of course, there's the growing noise that Marcus Edwards is actually a part of that deal, right? Look, I said this yesterday, and I'll, I'll reiterate it again. I do think that there is an added level of complication when. As far as, I'm, as far as I've been led to believe, I don't know if this is factually entirely true, but it would make sense that if you pay the relegation release clause, then the vending club, the seller, has to obviously let the player go. And on that terms, on that basis, there's no desire or need for them to be convenient for the purchasing club by allowing them to structure the payments over the period of the contract. And that's what would usually happen with, with most agreeable transfer fees. Um, if, if Pedro Poirot was to come to Tottenham for 40 million, but it was an agreeable fee that wasn't necessarily part of a relegation clause, then you would have you know, five years, eight million pound a pop. Easy to do, better for your cash flow you know, and, and your cash flow forecasting, easier to be able to participate in other endeavors all the time. And when Tottenham have probably got, I mean, I remember the last time that we saw the financial results that were reflecting on the 2021 season, we saw that there was £45 million of legacy short-term tra uh, player trading liabilities that hadn't been paid, that had to have been paid last summer. And so I think there was about £130 million of longer-term player trading liabilities, which are, you know, that will be structured and paid off over the course of those contracts. With Poro, that's not going to be the case. With Poro, if you want him, not only do you have to find the 40 million that, that you know, is probably reasonable for a player of his talents, but you have to find it right now. And if the rumours are true that Tottenham are also interested in Marcus Edwards, which, you know, to me, I don't think he's necessarily the right player to go for. I don't think he's worth 50 million pound purely because... You know, he had two good games against Tottenham, uh, you know, where he ran and ran rings around our defence. But, you know, that's not saying much. Plenty of teams have, and plenty of average players have had good moments against our defence this season. So, but Tottenham seem to be interested in, in him, right? And who am I to tell them who they should or shouldn't be, you know, looking at? But that's another £50 million player. Of course, we're only going to be paying 25 um, million on that, 26 million. So essentially Tottenham are going to have to find 65, 66 million pound that's right there in the cash balance, in the cash on hand to be able to go and uh, make make that happen. Which to me doubles down on my frustration of why they didn't take that last 50 million. I, I know why they didn't take the last 50 million because in my opinion they just valued it way out of track and they didn't get paid enough of a percentage increase in the ownership to justify it. Either that, or perhaps there's more truth to the rumours about Qatar or someone else coming in, injecting capital at a lower valuation, 
And on that basis, why would Enoch and Joe Lewis want to just give money away for, for free? We know the sort of people that they are. But either way, to have to find 66 million up front, when you've also got ongoing liabilities that are you know, monthly payments to the various clubs that we still owe people, you know, money to, Romero, Bentoncourt probably, you know, all of them. Any player that we bought recently or over the last four or five years will still be on some level paying them off. So I understand there's a frustration, but for the love of God, guys, just get it done, right? Just get it done. So we'll see what happens there. The articles that are coming out are now saying that you know, Tottenham are the only official club to have registered interest. Tottenham are about £6 million away in valuation. They've got to about £60 million, but they haven't got the final six. And I'm guessing Daniel Levy's just saying something along the lines of, look, will you meet us in the middle? If we give you £60 million, will you at least let us pay the last six off in instalments? And maybe Sporting are just saying, no, no chance. If you want our players, you're going to disrupt our team, then we're going to need that money now. And that's their prerogative and it's fair enough. And so for me, once again, I am all about Daniel Levy and Paratici, wherever you are, bro. Where are you, by the way? I haven't seen you for a long time. Just find a way to get it done and get it done soon so that we can all breathe some sort of collective sigh of relief. Anyway, that's about as far as I can bring you up to date on that one. The next one is Piero Hincapia. Hincapia. No one really knows. I don't even think Hincapia knows how to say his last name properly because I've heard it a thousand different ways. But you know what I'm talking about. Piero Hincapia. He is the Bayer Leverkusen left-sided centre-back. A very, very talented 21-year-old, for sure. For me personally, he's raw. He's still got mistakes in him. He still has the propensity to get completely bullied off the ball. If you haven't seen anything to suggest that about him, go and check out uh, Ecuador's World Cup game against Senegal. They, the front four of Senegal, absolutely bullied him for 90 minutes in that game. Um, Ishmael Saar, the Watford player, uh, the, I think it was Barr who was playing up front. I think the other guy on the right, I, could, I might be butchering his name, but is it Adeyu, Adeyabu or something, on the right-hand side, from memory, I, I could be completely wrong about that guy's name. And then, uh, was it Gwehi, Gwe, Gwe, Gweli or something, who plays in the 10 all four of those players, like strong, strong guys, but not tall guys. None of them are above six foot. I don't think any of them even were six foot. Somewhere between five eight and six foot. And they murdered Hincapia in that game. He looked like a, it was a boy against men. He's only five foot eleven himself, which I always find is a problem. I know that you know there's this argument that you don't have to be tall to be a centre-back, you know, and then they, they point you to the Black Swan example of Lis Lisandro Martinez. But that guy's got hops, right? He can really leap in the air, even though he's five foot eight. Most people that are solid in the air are naturally taller. Tottenham generally, I think, are very vulnerable in the air, always have been in the last couple of seasons. We can see a lot of our goals through either directly or indirectly aerial threats. And, you know, I'm not convinced by Hincapia aerially. However, if you look at his stats, and I'll put them up so you can see them. I've seen them, I've glanced at them, but uh, I haven't got them in front of me, so I might get some of these wrong. But generally speaking, for Leverkusen in the last 365 days against you know, other centre-backs, he's in the top 20 percentile for most of the things, if not all of the things that you would want from a centre-back. He's also very good and very comfortable at bringing the ball out with his feet, his passing, his progressive distance, even his dribbling is... Uh, pretty, pretty excellent for someone of his age. So look, I'm, I'm, I'm all about, you know, I'm fine with it. He's a good player. I know he'll become a very good player. But if you're going to bring him in, it's not happening in January, by the way. I think the plan would be, if there was any truth to it, it's going to be in the summer. But the, the consequences of that is that you're going to have another person who's raw, who's going to make mistakes. But you have to kind of, I guess, sit tight with that one. So you'd need somebody else to kind of help rotate with him. And I guess the options there would be either Ben Davies or Clement Longley. Longley, you know, I put a video out back in October when I first heard about this, and I couldn't believe it was true at the time. I'll put it up there so you can click on it if you want to. But uh, they said that they'd already made the decision that they weren't going to renew um, Longley's contract at the end of the season. He was here for one year and one year only, which to me was mind-bogglingly 
like short-sighted and knee-jerk at the time, especially when I thought he'd been, you know, uh, he, he'd made a very good introduction. And consequently, I look at him now and I reflect on Longley's season thus far as being, uh, he's been the best centre-back that we've had by, by a clear margin. Now, that's not saying much necessarily because everyone's been, you know, some shade of poor. But for me, I think that he's a very, a very good player. And for someone that's only here for a year, you know, I think the commitment that he's shown, the dedication and the passion that he put that he puts in, I think is quite, you know, an overwhelmingly positive metric to reflect on when thinking about whether you should actually make that move permanent and look for a new home for Ben Davies. No, I haven't got a problem with Ben Davies. I think he's been, he hasn't been that bad either. He's certainly been no, he's certainly been probably the second best centre back in the in the club this season, in my opinion. Um, but generally speaking, if you're going to bring Hincapier in, one of them has to make room. And I'm not sure off, off the top of my head what the rules are around Ben Davies is, as a homegrown. I know that something changed in that regard recently, so I don't know if that's an impact uh, on any decision. But I'd have no problem keeping Longley and going for this guy Hincapier. He's obviously not the Bastoni or the Guardiola that everyone would want. But I think you have to shake hands with reality and... You know, unless some massive investment comes in in the short term and suddenly changes everything with regard to Tottenham's abilities or Tottenham's willingness to go big, then maybe Hincapia is more aligned to the sort of model that Tottenham, um, you know, are looking to go for and, and hope that Paratici sees in Hincapia uh, what was seen in Romero. Interesting. But it, like I say, it's not going to happen in January, allegedly. So that's one for the future. But it's out and about in the news cycle today. Other news, Alan St. Maximum been linked with Tottenham again. Ali Gold mentioned it in his uh, Q&A session. He said that Paratici absolutely adores him and, uh, you know, and, and would welcome any interest there. But it's unlikely, even though Alan St. Maximum is playing off the bench and He's been used as a sub, sometimes unused sub in the last sort of seven or eight games for Newcastle. It's unlikely that he would leave anytime soon and it's unlikely that Newcastle would would even you know, listen to any kind of reasonable offers for him. So we're going to give that one a wah wah on a likelihood rating. Anything else to talk about, guys? Oh, what, one thing I would say about Hincapie, eh? I forgot to mention. Now he's only played 11 games this season. He's already got eight yellow cards. So uh, disciplinary record <laughs> isn't exactly something to, uh, something to write home about. But uh, yeah, like I say, interesting player, aggressive player. Sometimes maybe he gets his timing wrong, clearly. But um, someone that I'd be, all, all, you know, I'd, be, I'd be more than happy to see come in. What it does look like, though, you know, continuing on the same thread... It looks to me, and it's been written around the, the houses, that Antonio Conte sees three players coming in as his wishes being met for the January window. And they are a, a right wing back, a midfielder, and an attacking player. And so, you know, maybe that's where all of the links that we've been speaking about over the last month... All those links, when I've got to come out every day and said, I don't understand why we're being linked with Weston McKinney. I don't understand why we're being linked with, insert whoever here, right? Insert, there were so many. We went through so many of them. We need a centre-back. And Conte came out and said in the press conference, when he was asked, do we need new centre-backs? He said, no, I'm happy with the centre-backs I had. And everyone thought he was playing like some sort of 3D chess, trying not to disrespect the current uh, centre-backs, all that stuff. Look, it, it looks like there's a consensus among the supposed in-the-know journalists that Conte isn't looking for another centre-back in the short term. He's happy with what he has at the moment and that he wants a right wing back, someone in the midfield, obviously, to compete with the four or five we already have, and someone creative. And maybe the kind of, like, the... The revelation that Pape Sarr is starting to reveal to us all, maybe Conte would settle for two, and that would just be the forward to give some respite to our, you know, ridiculous injury list in that regard, and 
a right wing back so that we can all breathe a sigh of relief that we don't have to see the continued frustrations of slow, repetitive, build up, pull back play down the right hand side. That's as far as I can see it right now, guys. I mean, to me, I think that we will see two players coming in. I do think it will be something like a Pedro Porro, although maybe, you know, maybe that's all a smokescreen and we're looking elsewhere at the same time. Denzel Dumfries apparently into what, £50 million for Denzel Dumfries. If that's the, that's the cost, that's too much for me. He's rubbish, in my opinion. And not rubbish, he's just, he's, uh, he flatters to deceive. He had a couple of good games in a World Cup and suddenly his value has doubled. Nonsense. I think that Inter Milan's uh, hierarchy when it comes to negotiations is probably as stubborn and as frustrating uh, as Daniel Levy's is. But it is what it is. So I do think we'll see a right wing back. I think we'll see a um, some sort of forward coming in. Who that will be. Maybe it's Edwards, maybe it's someone else. But that's about it for today, guys. Nothing really else to talk about apart from North London derby. A little bit of injury news. Benton Core has been cleared to be a part of the squad, so we might see him. Doubt he'll start, which is great news. And Kulisevsky is back as well. So we walk into that game with you know a stronger looking um, a stronger looking squad, I guess, than what we've had recently. Unfortunately Arsenal are full strength apart from Gabriel Jesus and uh, one other player whose name escapes me. But there is a couple of yellow card risks in Saliba and Saka for Arsenal. So maybe those two players, whilst I think those two will certainly play, because I think Arteta's certainly, you know, he's not going to drop them for the risk. But they, if it's a spicy game and they get caught up in it, then maybe they're, they're going to be less likely to go in for those challenges. Because if they get a yellow card, they'll miss the Man United game, that the, uh, the following fixture. So it's all very interesting, guys. Loads and loads of things to think about and contemplate. And guess what? I'm even thinking about doing a live stream either tomorrow, maybe even this evening, before the end of the week to do an Arsenal preview with a couple of Arsenal fans that I know from around the community. So keep a look out for that one, guys. Like, share and subscribe. I wish you a very happy Wednesday. And as always, bye-bye.